Would you join with me in prayer? Oh Lord, we praise your name. God, we got to sing so many of your wonderful names in just those few songs. Lord, we are reminded that you are the great I am. You are eternal, eternally existent in three persons. You are um, Yahweh, which is the, the name that has been passed down traditionally as the interpretation of that statement, the great I am. You are the almighty El Shaddai. Lord, you are all powerful. There is nothing that can thwart your plans and promises to your people. And also, we get the name Jesus. And we praise you for that is indeed a beautiful name. God, as we unpack this text, as we uh, look at the, the birth account of our Lord Jesus and the naming and adoption of him by his earthly parents, Lord, we, we just pray, God, that you would impress upon us these truths, that you would open our eyes to the beauty and wonder that is found in, in these truths, in you, God. Would you grow us? Would you mature us more and more into the image of Jesus, our King of Kings? And for those who are here today, who may be here today, who are not found in Christ at this moment, Lord, would you save them? Would you save them by the name that means salvation? Lord, I can do none of these things apart from your Spirit's work among us. So would you be pleased by your Spirit to do these things? Would you challenge existing believers? Would you save unbelievers? And Lord, would none of us walk out of here unchanged, but rather looking more to you and more like you. We thank you for this time to gather and sing these truths and, and gather under your word. We pray all these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our King. Amen. Well, church, I would encourage you to stay standing uh, as we read from God's word. We are in the Gospel of Matthew, the book of Matthew, the first book of our New Testament, and we, uh, we are in verse 18. We're going to begin in verse 18 and go all the way down to verse 25. Matthew writes, Now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Amen. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke from his sleep, he did, not, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife, but knew her not until she had given birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. This is the word of the Lord. Please be seated. <clears throat> well, good morning, church. Good morning. I think we may have lost some people today. I think there might be some wounded soldiers out there. Uh, it's going around for sure, isn't it? Goodness gracious. What a day it will be when sin and sickness also is behind us. Amen? Yeah. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Well, good morning, church. Uh, my name is Max Monahan. If I don't know you, uh, I'm the lead pastor here of this outfit. Um, thankful to be so. Uh, if we haven't met, could we meet? Could we meet? I would love to meet you. I'll be by the doors. 
on the way out, I would actually really like to get to know you. I'm not just blowing smoke. I, I love people. I would love to get to know you. Well, as many of you know, I am, uh, I'm going to seminary right now. That's something I'm doing concurrently with this ministry. And uh, last night, I finished up a New Testament studies course, which was actually the thing that really led me to um, want to lead us through Matthew. It was the thing that really impressed that upon me. But outside of that, something that has really been striking to me as I've been going through this course is that there are an overwhelming amount of false teachers in our New Testament. Like every book in the New Testament deals with it in some capacity. Even the letters written to the churches that are actually doing pretty well, there's usually somebody who needs to be addressed either explicitly or implicitly who is pushing something that goes against what we would call orthodox Christianity. Now for the uninitiated, what I mean by that is the bare essentials of the faith. The things that you absolutely have to believe in order to get God right, and this whole thing right for that matter. Take, for instance, something like the resurrection. We'll see later on in the book of Matthew that the Sadducees were pushing this lie that there was no resurrection of the dead. And we'll see it uh, addressed again in 1 Corinthians 15. But what's at stake if we lose that? Well, according to Paul, the whole thing falls apart. For if there is no resurrection, then we are most of all to be pitied. We're fools. Or what about, what about the notion of Christ's return? Because there have been some that believed that Christ already came back, and we missed it. That's what Paul was addressing with the Thessalonians. That's what they were up against. And he said to them, I do not want you to be uninformed, brothers. This is how it will go down. Something similar happened in Peter's letters with Some guys denying that Jesus would return based on Old Testament misinterpretations to which Peter had to say, we didn't follow cleverly devised myths when we preached to you his return. We were with him. We heard the voice from heaven. He's coming back. We have the prophetic word more fully confirmed. But what about Jesus' first coming? What happens if we lose that? What happens if Jesus wasn't born of the Virgin Mary? What happens if he wasn't adopted by Joseph from the tribe of David, the kingly line? What's at stake, in other words, if you lose the incarnation? Well, this is our title of the message this morning, and it gives us a hint. His incarnation, your salvation. His incarnation, your salvation. Now I should mention, just because Jesus was born, you're not immediately saved, okay? There's a lot that had to happen, and we'll get to that later. But it is to say that apart from his incarnation, there can be no salvation. Now a little historical context. This book of Matthew was written by Matthew, believe it or not. He was a tax collector when Jesus found him. He was also referred to as Levi. He became one of Jesus' 12 disciples, 12 apostles. He wrote to a predominantly Jewish Christian audience in the 60s AD. And he's writing with a very intentional purpose. And that is to teach them all about how Jesus is the long-awaited Messiah and King of Israel who has come to fulfill the law and prophets and to bring salvation to his people to those who will receive him with childlike faith, and he's here to bring about his kingdom. And that's in line with our main theme for the day, and it's this. If you're taking notes, this will be our big idea, our guiding light. Jesus' birth and adoption story fulfills Old Testament expectations and shows God's faithfulness toward you. If you get hand cramps, just write this. We see God being faithful to you. In this text. And I'll explain that as we go. But this story also fulfills Old Testament expectations. And this is this makes sense given what we got into last week. We got into how Jesus' genealogy was really teeing up for us this, this Davidic line that Jesus had to come from because that was the line of the kings. 
We saw that that really set the stage for where we are today. Now here's going to be our, our plot for the morning. We're going to follow this, um, this scenario in which the Davidic line is almost ruined. Okay, It's going to go like this. Joseph decides to divorce Mary, thwarting our hopes of a Davidic king. He has a dream, and then we're told the meaning of all that's going on, and then Joseph fulfills his duty in light of that dream and what he's told there. And in the midst of all of this, guys, I really need you to see this, and we're going to go over it time and time again, so I don't know how you're not going to, but maybe you do. God is so sovereign. He's not just fulfilling words, he's fulfilling history. Historical events are leading to Jesus. God's hands are all over this. This whole text is a fulfillment. And if you would receive it, it's a fulfillment of something that we talked about last week, which was Abraham. Abraham who, who was told that the promise would come through his firstborn son, not his son from the illegitimate woman, but through his wife Sarah. Here's our first point for the morning. The dynasty is in danger. The dynasty is in danger. And we see that in verses 18 through 19. The dynasty is in danger. Let's read those verses together. Now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. No sooner do we get through the genealogy from last week do we get to a problem. Jesus is supposed to come from this line of David. He's supposed to be legally in Joseph's lineage, but then we find out that Joseph's about to divorce Mary. And that means that he probably won't be taking ownership of her unborn son either. So this is not a great start. Some context would probably be helpful here. At this point, we know from Luke's account that Mary had already been visited by the angel Gabriel. He told her all about how she would become pregnant with the son by the Holy Spirit. But in Matthew's account, we don't get such details. However, we do get Joseph's side of the story. Joseph, of course, will go on to be Jesus' earthly father, spoiler alert. But interestingly, he'll never be called Jesus' father at all in this book. A look back at the genealogy, and you'll see him referred to as the husband of Mary. Mary being the one of whom Jesus was born. It doesn't say the father of Jesus, even though that's what all the other men say it will also say things like he rose took the child not his child and his mother by night so it should be clear to us not just here but elsewhere also joseph is not the biological father of jesus his one true father that's god the father now we're told here also that joseph is betrothed to this woman mary which back then was more than simply being engaged, okay? If you were to call it off, that would require divorce papers. And if one person were to die, that would make you a widow. Consequently, the Old Testament rules for adultery would also apply here. And if you didn't know, in the Old Testament, that was punishable by, by death. Now, under Roman law, Rome being the sovereign governing body over Jerusalem, they prohibited capital punishment in such cases. And so, that would, um, so what they would do at that time was they would have a very public trial instead. And the accused would be put to open shame. And the open shame, excuse me. And the other would go scot-free. Now that was the standard, but we read Joseph willing to go the road less taken. Now we get two descriptors for him. It says that he is a just man, which is to say that he is righteous. He's law-abiding. And we read that he was unwilling to put her to shame. And so we see Joseph, bound by his conscience, ending up doing something or setting out to do something that could be considered as the bare minimum from a, a legal obeying God's law standpoint. 
Again, going back to the Old Testament, legal proceedings, accusations, all of that were to be on the grounds of two or three witnesses. And so he was going to limit this whole ordeal to as few people as possible and still be obedient. Now at this point, I have to wonder, I don't know about you guys, but I got to wonder, what is Joseph thinking in this whole thing, right? Um, I took the liberty, I'm not, I don't have it on the screen here because this is not inspired, I don't want you necessarily taking notes on my thought process, but I made a, a what do you call this, a decision tree, right? What was Joseph thinking? Mary is pregnant. Either she told him or she didn't tell him. Well, I would say she probably told him. We have no evidence that she was deceitful in any way. So she probably told him. Well, does she tell him the whole story, Holy Spirit and all? Or does she tell him a a version of it? Well, again, I would say she's not deceitful. She told him the whole thing. Then the next question is, does he believe her? Well, I think it's possible that he, he trusted her. But didn't necessar- he wasn't necessarily bought in. Otherwise, why would he need a visitation from an angel? And this makes sense because, because he does love her. He does trust her. That's why he's being compassionate toward her. But either way, that's just conjecture. We don't have any evidence in the text that says one way or another how this went down. We just know she's pregnant from a conception of the Holy Spirit. And Joseph is resolving to do this in a very admirable way. At this point, while we wonder, we can't know. Whatever the case, he took this com- the, the, the compassionate route. He loved his bride. And up to this point, even though he was going to divorce her, because he was so faithful to God's word, he couldn't cast her away outright. But he also wanted to protect her, even as he obeyed the, wa- obeyed the law. And can we just take a moment, real quick, can we just check our hearts for a moment whether Jesus excuse me whether Joseph believed the best about his bride or whether he didn't fully trust her but still had compassion toward her what we see here is a man who is living in the tension between the world and godliness spectacularly now the point of the text is not to go out here and emulate Joseph but boy if he doesn't set the standard for how to live in the world as a Christian He's committed to obeying the law, but not in such a way as to hurt others. Look at those words in verse 19, unwilling to put her to public shame. This really should be our heart place. We should be concerned for the souls of the people of this world, even as they slander and blaspheme, even as they revile God's good design of men and women, even as they make fun of our religion, even as we in turn seek to live out God's commands. If we're honest with ourselves... We don't really do this all that well. A lot of the time, we can do one of those things pretty well. We might obey God's commandments, but then at the same time have no sympathy for those who do not. Or we might be real acquainted with the world, and then we don't actually end up obeying God's word. But to do what Joseph does here, I don't think that's our gut response. I think of uh, working in you know, a secular workplace, which I'm, I have no doubt many of you do. We don't want to work there because we want to be away from that. And to some degree, that's a good thing, but God may very well have you there, a compassionate Christian who does obey his law, not altogether unlike Joseph, there in that very workplace that you might plead to him on their behalf, that you might extend the grace of the gospel to them. Let me encourage you to consider that. Next time you're with your unbelieving friends and family and you're tempted to get upset when they're cursing, when they're gossiping, there's a way to go about it where you're not getting sucked in, you're not joining in, but you're still having compassion toward them. I would say aim for that. There's something of a tightrope walk here, right? Not in the world, but of the world. Righteous and compassionate, merciful, holy and set apart, and yet seeking the world's benefit or the benefit of those in the world, rather. Yes, Joseph is a great example to us. And that would be enough for us, but before we move on, there's two things that we should pay attention to. Number one, there are already Old Testament expectations being fulfilled. 
the absolute first verse of the narrative of the, excuse me, the first verse of the first narrative that we get in our New Testament, before they came together, she was found to be with child by the Holy Spirit, points to this. The, the fact that the Spirit is wrapped up in this, this should have been drawing to mind for that audience thoughts of messianic expectations and the kingdom that he would bring about. They would have known of God's promises in the Old Testament for the new covenant, a day that he said he would give them his spirit, that they might be able to fully obey him. They may very well have recognized that this would have been the firstborn in that vein, the first one to have the spirit, the Davidic king to come, who would usher in that day in which they would also get his spirit. So one verse in, and we're already seeing the Old Testament being fulfilled, but also this, back to the title of our first point, another Old Testament expectation is actually in jeopardy right now. Because what happens if he's not legally considered from the tribe of David? This dynasty is really in danger. Thankfully for us, our text continues. And it's here that we'll see the divine directive. The divine directive. And we see that in verses 20 through 21. Matthew writes, But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Our last point presented the problem. But we don't even really have that much time to consider that problem because as soon as it's presented, action occurs. One commentator translated the first words of verse 20, but hardly had the thought come into his mind when. This is where we really begin to see for the first time in this passage that theme of God's sovereignty that we talked about. God, as the creator and sustainer of creation, he is able to do with it as he pleases. And that's okay because he's a good God. But no sooner does Joseph decide he's going to go do something, does he literally have this vision of an angel. God intervenes. That's how determined to bring about his providential purposes God is. He's faithful. But that's just a taste. You'll notice we get no description of the angel either. So uh, wonder all you like, but there's just, there's nothing for us to go on. Angels are a messenger from God, so they're not meant to take center stage. If they were, we might get a description, but we don't. I do think it's interesting that the angel doesn't have to say, fear not, in, uh, akin to how, how the angels spoke to Mary and the shepherds in Luke's account. And I would say that's because Joseph is seeing this in a dream. You know, weird things make sense in a dream. When you're in the middle of a field watching sheep and an angel appears to you, it's a little bit more startling. In any event, what does the angel say? The angel doesn't open up with fear not. He opens up with Joseph, son of David. The first words out of this angel's mouth address Joseph in royal terms. And this is a reminder, we're not dealing with any small matter of family law. We're dealing with the bloodline of the Messiah. Now, the angel does then go on to say, do not fear, but it's not because an angel was in his presence. No, he tells him not to fear to take Mary to be his wife. And again, we got to wonder, what, what could Joseph have been thinking? Perhaps there was the fear that she had been unfaithful. Maybe that's the fear. Or maybe he was worried about how he'd be perceived, either that he'd look like a chump or that he'd look unrighteous, having shirked the law in favor of keeping a wife who was pregnant from another. In any case, no fear was necessary, said the angel, for this baby is not from any human being. This wasn't her being unfaithful. No, this baby in her womb is from the Holy Spirit. It's at this point that Joseph is brought in on what we already know as the audience. He's working with the same information as us, and it's come to him from a divine messenger, just like his wife Mary, an angel of the Lord. But before the angel departs, he continues to repeat that which his bride had already heard in Luke's account. She will bear a son, 
and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Now the fulfillment of these words is explained in our next section, but at this point I will say this much. Careful observers will see that verses 21, 23, and 25 make use of a very similar structure of sentence and very similar wording. The phrasing of this, this verse perfectly mirrors verse 23, which is the Old Testament passage it draws from, and that's by design. It's showing that verse 23 is supposed to be the apex. It's the passage that we see the rest of the text in light of. But we'll get there. For now, let's break down the words that we have before us. She will bear a son. Uh, first and foremost, praise God. And I don't say that because uh, sons are the best and daughters are not awesome. I say praise God because in this passage we've already seen A, David, B, the Holy Spirit, and now C, it's going to be a boy. So all things are moving forward in the right direction of an heir to the throne. Now for the astute hearer, it may also harken back to Isaiah 9, 6, which we got into not a few weeks ago. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given. And we know that text was for sure foreshadowing this son to come. But we read on and we we see the angel's instructions for naming the boy. Now, if you're new to the faith or perhaps you're seasoned in it, but you just haven't come across these answers yet, you might be wondering, what is the deal with names in the Bible? It's like all over the place. Such a big deal. Why? Why? Well, I would say to some degree we can actually relate to this. If I were to mention the name of somebody you love dearly, perhaps a a spouse or a family member, your best friend maybe, it'll no doubt bring to mind uh, feelings of love, of warmth, of comfort, of joy. So to some degree, even you associate name with person. Likewise, if I were to mention a wayward friend or family member, there might be feelings of pain, of hurt, of unpleasantness. So we can understand this. But with the Bible, in God's word, every word means something, including and especially the names. Including and especially the names for God. When Moses asked God who he should say sent him, God says, Exodus 3.14, I am who I am. That's where we get the name Yahweh. It's a transliteration of the Hebrew characters there. And he said, say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. See, God has said a great many things just by saying his name there. He said, in effect, I am the eternal God. I am. I have always been, I will always be. Furthermore, I don't exactly answer to you. (laughs) I am authority in and of myself. So too here we get one name for this son to be born. You shall call his name Jesus. And what a beautiful name it is. The name Jesus that we have in our texts is actually a Latin pronunciation Follow with me here. A Latin pronunciation of a Greek transliteration of the Hebrew name Yehoshua. It's actually more like Yehoshua. Yehoshua, or the shortened version, Yeshua, which means Yahweh is salvation and Yahweh saves, respectively. Now, Matthew's audience would have likely known that. But that doesn't stop him from explaining it. He says, for he will save his people from their sins. And this is where we really start to see God's faithfulness in this text. Because while this whole narrative tells the story of Jesus' Davidic lineage being preserved, we recognize that it's for our good. Those who would be called his people. What's particularly interesting, if I may, is that our verse 21 here is actually a copy of a verse from the Old Testament. Stay with me here. Psalm 130, verse 8, it says, And he will redeem Israel from all his iniquities. 
Now, you may likely be picking up on some similarities. Psalm 130, verse 8, he will redeem Israel from his iniquities. Our verse 21, he will save his people from their sins. With that kind of similarity and yet a deviation in some of the wording, we have to ask why the change. Well, if you remember last week, Matthew primed the pump for this new kingdom by inserting the names of some Gentile women in his genealogy. Likewise, this is meant to reframe our understanding of what Jesus' kingdom is going to be like. In other words, what Matthew is foreshadowing here is the church. It's made up of both Jews and Gentiles, not ethnic Israel alone. That's why Israel is subbed out for his people. His people will be made up of people from every nation. And what will he do for these people? He will save them from their sins. Now, I don't know what you walked in here knowing about God. But whether this is brand new to you or you hear it every single week in this church, you need to hear this. Okay, there is an eternally existent, I am God. I'm not God. (laughs) I mean, there's a God that goes by I am. You know what I mean. Uh, Three in person, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He is perfect and holy and good and just and he is the definition of love and out of the abundance of his love he created the heavens and the earth and every single creature that dwells therein including us in fact human beings were the pinnacle of his creative work created after his likeness in his own image to glorify him as his representatives on earth and all that man and uh, his bride eve had to do was obey god was to not do the one thing that he commanded them not to do, and yet that was the one thing that they did do. When they sinned against God, they chose to glorify themselves over creator. They fractured a relationship with their God that was perfect up to this point. And that's when the plague began. The most devastating plague the world has ever known. The plague of sin manufactured by man's disobedience. It spread like gangrene to, gangrene to every subsequent human being that would be born thereafter. And with this infection came the ability to, or, or rather, prevented the ability to get back to God. But God didn't leave us there. God sent his son Jesus. God the Father sent Jesus the Son down to earth to pay the punishment for the sins that we all committed. The wages of sin is death, and and he paid that penalty on our behalf. And how did he do that? How did he save his people from their sins? He lived a perfect life. He earned the righteousness that they needed in order to re-enter God's holy presence, in order to reconcile that relationship with them. And it wouldn't be enough to add righteousness to a, uh, 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 an unrighteous human being. And so the unrighteousness needed to be taken care of too. And so what else did he do? But he, he died for their sins. He willingly marched to his own execution at the hands of friends who betrayed him, at the hands of men that he, he came to save, lawless men. He died a brutal death on a cross in order to pay that punishment, in order to forgive you of your sins or to achieve the forgiveness of your sins. He also was resurrected, which is the good news of that story, that our God didn't stay dead. He was resurrected, and in that resurrection, you find your hope for resurrection in the future, bodily then and spiritually in the life right now and in the present. And after all this, Hebrews 1, 3 through 4 says, after making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. There Christ rules and reigns and intercedes on behalf of his people. He is still saving to the uttermost. And all it takes on our part is is repentance. It's turning away from our sin. It's recognizing our sin before a holy God and instead putting our faith in him instead of our own efforts, instead of our own works, instead of sin. 
we put our faith in Jesus. The truth is we all sin, but for those who repent and believe upon Christ for the salvation of their souls, they will be eternally saved from the punishment of their sins. And that means that when he returns to judge the living and the dead, and he will, when he ushers in the fully realized version of the kingdom that he began with his first coming, you won't be rightly judged for your unrighteousness. You'll receive mercy because Jesus paid for all your sins. He already bore that punishment. So if you're a believer here today, that means a couple of things. Number one, you don't have to be the victim of your sin anymore. The cycle has been broken. You can say no to sin. Where you were once powerless and, and you could only ever sin, you have achieved victory through Jesus. Though you will not walk that victory out perfectly this side of eternity, you can choose to not sin. And it means that you're saved from the guilt that accompanies those times that you don't say no to sin. Because you, you can press into that forgiveness anew. You're saved from all that. That's what that blessed name, that name that is so precious to you now, believer, you who are in him, that's what that name Jesus means to you. You hear the word and you think, what a beautiful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ, my King. And if you are not in Christ today, I'm here to tell you, you, you need saving. There will be a judgment, and you will stand unrepresented on that day. Should you reject that beautiful name in this life, on that day you will meet the unbridled wrath of God, far beyond anything you've seen in this life, which is stored up for all those who practice unrighteousness, all those who are not shielded by Jesus' righteousness. Yet that name can mean salvation for you today. Would that you turn from your sin. Recognize what your sin is before a holy God. And put your faith in Jesus for the salvation of your soul. And if I may sweeten the deal, uh, if I may do the um, ShamWow guy or the uh, uh, Flex Seal guy, you know. But wait, there's more. Inherit salvation, eternal life, repaired relationship with God that was only there at the, the beginning in the garden, adoption into his family, adoption into this family, the church, this people, those whom Jesus came to save, and so much more, his discipline, his favor, all of it can be yours for the low, low place price of repenting of your sins and putting your faith in him. Now, I don't really mean to make it a sales pitch, but it's really that simple. It's just laying your pride aside and putting your faith in Jesus. Now, one more thing before we move on. I just want you to consider the types of names that we have for God up to this point, okay? Up to Jesus' arrival. I am Almighty, Most High, the God who sees do you know what kind of names are markedly absent here? Bill, Joe, Derek, and why? Why don't we get a first name for God? Because those are people names. And yet, here we have the second person of the Trinity coming down to earth, and he's going by Joshua. God took on a human name. Something to consider as we transition to our third point, which is along those lines. Third point is this, the drama decoded. The drama decoded. And we see that in verses 22 through 23. All of this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. We don't always get texts explained to us. Uh, I feel like I know that firsthand as a pastor. 
uh, sometimes I'm like, God, I need so much help on this passage. But in Matthew's gospel, this actually happens pretty frequently. Matthew wants us to know the point behind what he's telling us. Thank you, Matthew, for holding our hand. (laughs) Now to revisit something we've already talked about many times today, this is showing that God is sovereign over human history. This is showing that what he has already declared in times past was pointing forward to what is happening in this account. Jesus is the pinnacle of that which has already happened, which is a profound concept, by the way, because it makes sense to predict the future, right? We, that's what we think of when we think of prophecy, like this will come to pass, and then it does come to pass. But it's an entirely different thing when you make something happen And that thing predicts another thing that will come to pass. We briefly talked about it a few weeks ago. What's being talked about here is from Isaiah 7, 14. And in that passage, we have Isaiah the prophet speaking to King Ahaz, the king of Judah. He's delivering, as it were, a message of comfort. He's saying to him, even though you are up against seemingly insurmountable forces, it's two particular nations that were coming against Judah, They will not prevail because I'm with you. The actual text says, Again the Lord spoke to Ahaz, Ask a sign of the Lord your God. Let it be as deep as Sheol or high as heaven. But Ahaz said, I will not ask, and I will not put the Lord to the test. And he said, Hear then, O house of David, is it too little for you to weary me, or excuse me, weary men, that you weary my God also? Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and she shall call his name Emmanuel. Now, that context had to do with the birth of Ahaz's son, King Hezekiah. Both those guys were mentioned in our genealogy last week, for reference. That was God's proof to Ahaz that he was faithful to him and his people. Now, I think it should be pointed out that in the Hebrew of that passage in Isaiah, the word we get translated virgin, this is just kind of a cool aside, okay? I really appreciate it. If you don't, tune out for a second. No, don't, just, I'm going to keep going. The Hebrew of that passage in Isaiah, the word that we get translated virgin, that word most likely meant a young woman, either of the age of marriage or a young married woman. It's the word Alma. That word got translated in the Greek Septuagint, which is the Greek version of the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, as Parthenos, okay? And that means virgin. In other words, God sovereignly worked through the translation of languages to tweak this existing historical event, something that was already a fulfillment of that prophecy from Isaiah, to say that a virgin, instead of a young woman, which we recognize foreshadows what's about to happen in our passage. I don't know if that makes sense or if you're tracking with me, but the point is God works even in the translation of texts to fully suit what he's bringing about. It's at this point that I just want to call to mind this, this one piece of application. When we have something happening in history, when, when Isaiah is literally prophesying about an event that's going to happen, and that prophecy and event prophesy another event, we're talking about something that theologians have called multiple fulfillments of redemptive history. Now, I'm not going to say that every single event, just one after another after another, okay? I think you can get really carried away with this. But what I, what I want you to see is that God's word is so infinitely rich. We should be inclined to feast here. You will never fully mine the depths of God's word, ever. That's why something like a reading plan is so important. If you're not doing the reading plan, it's not too long to, it's not too far to catch up. I don't know what's going on with my words today, you guys. You can do it. That's what I'm trying to say. You can catch up if you wanted to. It's so, so good to be in God's word every day. So that's really 
about the historical event, but what about that name? And they shall call his name Emmanuel. Now, in the context of that Isaiah passage, that was saying that God will not abandon them to be destroyed by other nations. But in the context of our passage today, it's a very different meaning. Matthew is telling us here, not that God is for you, like he's got your back, not that it's not true, right? But that God himself was physically, tangibly, bodily with us. This goes back to him getting a human name. This is unheard of. Up to now, his name was El Shaddai, God Almighty, or El Roy, the God who sees, or El Ohim, the omnipotent creator God. But now we have Emmanuel, which means God with us. We have Yehoshua. We have Jesus. He's coming in the form of man. And I mentioned that verses 21, 23, and 25 are all framed the same way. Well, that really draws our attention to the fact that this sentence is the same, but the name has been swapped out. It begs the question, why? Why does it say, you shall call his name Jesus? And this is to fulfill what says, his name will be called Emmanuel. Why? What that means is that salvation, the meaning of Jesus, Yahweh saves Yahweh is salvation, is accomplished by God being with us. The meaning of Emmanuel. We needed God to come down to earth, and he did. That's the only way we're going to see salvation from our sins. We needed somebody to represent us as one of us. Hebrews 2.17, Therefore he had to be made like his brothers in every respect so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. To save us from our sins, he had to be like us. Now there's a lot here for us, church. For one, if you're looking for the definition of holiness, of love, of goodness, of God, look no further than the person, the God-man, the Son, Jesus Christ. That's one of the benefits of walking through this gospel from Matthew. We get to see God incarnate, incarnate, week after week. That's what John was touching on in his gospel when he said, The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen His glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. He really walked the earth. God himself came down, the very epitome of love, the essence of goodness in bodily form, your perfect example of holy living, of godliness, he dwelt among us. And that's for sure what the people alive in Jesus' day would have experienced. Those who would believe would have recognized, this is God here. The prophet in the temple who said, I can die happy now. I've seen this baby. I've seen your Messiah But it's not just that God was physically with them and then he went away and that was that. It's not just that he was here spatially breathing the same air as us, but then he went and ascended to the right hand of God. No, because for the Christian, those of us who are, to go back to the last point, his people, he continues to be with us because he has sent us his spirit, the Holy Spirit, to dwell within us. That's how he's able to say at the end of this very gospel, I will be with you until the end of the age. Even though he knows he's about to go to be with the Father, it's because he was going to send the Spirit to his people. That's what's at work when you're convicted of sin. That's the Holy Spirit, God, with us. When you have that prick in your conscience, when you're reminded of what God's word says on a thing, and so you, you go the other way, that's God with us. When you're encouraged to share the gospel, God with us. All of that, that began here with the incarnation of Jesus Christ when God with us happened. And because God became like us in the birth of Jesus Christ to the Virgin Mary, and ever since, God with us continues to happen. I just want to say at this point, behold, the condescension of your God. The Son forsook heaven, paradise, physical communion with the Father in order to come down to our level. 
And he continues to meet us where we're at by his spirit. Consider, Christian, where you were at when he found you. You weren't righteous. You weren't doing great. You might have thought you were doing great, but you weren't. He delivered you. He came down here to do that and even assumed a form not unlike your form in order to do so. This is our God. My prayer for you would be that you recognize this in your day-to-day. Recognize what he did back then in the sending of his son to be born of a human woman, to dwell among us, as well as the sending of his spirit, which you reap the benefit of every single day, whether you know it or not, and that you would go about all your days as if God were with you, because he literally is. You're never alone. Let that be the thought that comes into your mind when you're tempted. Let it be what comes to your mind when you're discouraged, when it seems like you are alone. You're not, because your God he is with you. Our story today is not finished. We need our fourth point here. <clears throat> We've seen an angel appear to Joseph, but we need his response. And so we have this fourth point, the descent defended. The descent defended. When Joseph woke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife, but knew her not until she had given birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. Our story comes to a close with these words, and as far as I can tell, there's really, there's really two things we can glean from this passage, and they're familiar themes, if you've been paying attention today. This is ground we've already tread. The first thing is this. In verse 24 there, we read of Joseph's perfect obedience. A buddy of mine from a seminary, he likes to tell his kids, you know, uh, he, he says, what, what do I mean when I say obey? And they say, I had to look at the notes because I often get it twisted. Right away, all the way, without delay. So good. I love that. In Joseph's case, we see that in full. As soon as he had awoken, right away. We see that for him, it was a multi-pronged obedience. We see he did it all the way. He took her, which is to say that he accepted her as his wife. He wholeheartedly believed the Lord at his word. And he also called the boy by his name that he was instructed to give him. Both of those being two pieces that would have been necessary in order to legitimize this thing, in order to legally adopt Jesus. And Joseph did both of them all the way. And we recall that this adoption is one of the principal pieces in our salvation being accomplished. And so this is not just Joseph being faithful to what the Lord called him to, it's also God being faithful to us. While we're on the subject of Joseph's obedience, I won't spend too much time here, but we do read Joseph, read of Joseph doing something that we never heard him be requested or, excuse me, instructed not to do. And that's this piece about him not knowing her until she had given birth. I think what we have here is a clear demonstration of Joseph's character. He is not just obeying what was explicitly commanded of him. He's obeying the heart of the commandment. This is him saying, I'm going to honor you in full. I'm not, I'm not saying, okay, but did you really say, did, is that really what you meant? Okay, so that's all I have to do? Great. No, he, he wants to cover all of his bases. I'm not even, I'm not even, I'm going to wait and we're going to do this thing legit. Right now is the Holy Spirit's time. We can see also God sovereignly protecting the virgin birth account. For if Joseph did know his wife in the biblical sense, there could be cause for controversy, for illegitimizing the virgin birth. Could say, oh, that was just Joseph's son. But he wanted to do it right. He waited until they came together in their home, which is to say that they were officially married. And after the son had been born, in fact, it was the Holy Spirit's time and it was Jesus' time. God was sovereignly protecting the virgin birth account. And that brings me to the other nugget I wanted to pull from these two verses. Joseph is perfectly obedient, but God is also perfectly sovereign. 
These two are not unrelated. This is, this is where we live. How much of our time is spent practicing obedience even though we don't know what God has in store? This is all about trust. We trust that when we have that difficult conversation about sin in someone's life, God is in control. Whether they repent or get angry, that's his jurisdiction, not ours. We just have to be obedient. We trust that when we preach the gospel to non-believers, it's not up to how well we phrase it because ultimately that's his territory. We trust that when we don't resort to underhanded practices in order to free ourselves from the financial hole that we found ourselves in, that God sees our obedience and that he knows the, the spot that we're in, that he will provide for us, even if it doesn't look like winning the lotto. In other words, in light of his sovereignty, in light of this God who is able to weave human history in such a way as to bring about all of it perfectly, this God who can bring a child from the womb of a virgin, who can preserve a family bloodline, who can fulfill prophetic words and historical events, one and the same, in light of his sovereignty, we trust and obey just like Joseph. And so we see, brothers and sisters, in these verses, the fulfillment of the coming of the Davidic king has been protected. Jesus' legal claim to the throne, it remains intact. His descent, as it were, has been defended. And all of this really takes us back to the same theme that we've rehearsed time and time again today. God is sovereign over it all. It doesn't matter that Old Testament prophecies about the Davidic king were seemingly almost thwarted after thousands of years of waiting and at the very last minute, no less, with Joseph's intentions to divorce. Because that's nothing to the God of the universe who not only is in control of all history, but he actually wrote it from the beginning long ago. Old Testament events like the birth of King Hezekiah, those only point forward to the virgin birth of King Jesus with even the name being a foretaste of the king to come. It's all there. And this church is not to say that God is a puppet master pulling strings because along with God's sovereignty, as our text today has made very clear, this is demonstrating his faithfulness to you. That's why the very apex of this passage is the notion that God is with us. The God-man Jesus whose namesake is meant to remind us that he will save us from our sins May it be that we trust in him and seek to be obedient. May it be that we rest in his sovereignty, the sovereign God who set out to save us from our sins. Might we be faithful in light of his faithfulness, for he indeed is faithful, isn't he? Well, let's pray. Lord, you are faithful. Um, Paul wrote to Timothy that even when we are faithless, you remain faithful because you can't deny yourself. That's just who you are. And God, your faithfulness is all over this text. Your faithfulness, your sovereignty, Lord, we, we praise you that you are so for us, that you went to such great lengths in order to reconcile us to yourself. We who sin so greatly against you, you came in to clean up our mess, God, and to draw us to yourself. We thank you, Lord, for the truths that we've seen in your word today. I pray, God, that they, they would not soon leave us, but that they would, they would sit on us. A, a burden that cannot be shaken, a burden that actually frees, but one that we wrestle with, Lord, that we remind ourselves of in times of duress, in times of stress, and in our hour of need, might we remind ourselves that you are with us that you are sovereignly working all things together for the good of those who love you, who are called according to your purpose. God, we just thank you for you. We thank you for this incarnation account. We thank you for your son, Jesus, and the life that we have in him. Praise be to you, God. We pray it all in your son, Jesus' name. Amen.